Hi, my name is Sarah. Hi, my name is Megan. And we are P3s here at the Yukon School of Pharmacy. Um, today, we're gonna be talking about being in a constant state of readiness with regards to the pharmacist involvement in stroke emergencies. Um, our preceptors for this project was Susan Hoff, PharmD, BCACP from Lawrence Memorial Hospital, who specializes in anticoagulation, and Lydia Durenzo, PharmD, who specializes in emergency medicine. So we originally created this poster for a CE poster contest or surrounded around the idea of a constant state of readiness. We adopted this poster for the student health fair as we think that the idea of understanding the symptoms associated with a stroke are very important for everyone to understand whether they're in the medical profession or not. So a good acronym to understand the symptoms of stroke is the acronym called FAST. The F in FAST stands for facial drooping. A stands for arm weakness, S stands for speech disturbances, and T stands for time to call 911. So these symptoms are important for everyone to understand because the less time that someone who is experiencing a stroke takes them to get to the hospital, the less damage that they're gonna have and the better off that they're going to be. So it's important for everyone to understand those symptoms. Uh, one other reason why we decided to choose for this project specifically was there was a study done um, by the American Heart Association comparing the pre-COVID admission rates for stroke in the ED to during the admit period of March 17th to April 15th, which was during the COVID pandemic 2020. And the study found that there is a statistically significant reduction in the amount of people who are coming into emergency departments with strokes. And they found that it was 36.4% reduction in the amount of people coming in with stroke. So we thought it was really important to really highlight key signs and symptoms of stroke. And then also highlight, because we are pharmacy students, the beneficial role that pharmacists can play in responding to stroke codes. So to start off, Sarah's gonna go over the top arrow diagram. So this first top arrow represents the patient's arrival at the hospital through their hospital admission. Um, so within the first 10 minutes of EMS arrival, we call this phase the assessment and stabilization phase. Um, this is where the stroke team will be activated. Um, to start, where you see the little medication bottles on the poster indicate where pharmacist intervention is often used and required uh, for better patient outcomes. So first, we're going to assess the vital signs. Pharmacists are involved in this, as many of the exclusion criteria for the use of fibrinolytic therapy involve vital sign assessment. Um, the stroke team will be activated, usually in a hospital setting. It will be activated prior to the patient's arrival with an estimated time of arrival for the stroke team to know over the loudspeaker so that way they can get down to the emergency room and treat the patient in a timely manner. And lastly, we're going to urgently want to order a CAT scan just so we can see if there's a brain bleed as this can affect the pharmacologic therapy that the patient receives. So within 25 minutes of the patient's arrival, this is where the providers are going to use the NIH stroke scale to go ahead and evaluate the severity of the patient's stroke. They're going to also establish the last known normal, which is often get, gotten from the caregiver or the patient themselves if the stroke is not severe, of the time where they last felt themselves at baseline. This can affect the pharmacotherapy as well, as we will go over later in the poster. And the pharmacists also play a crucial role in reviewing the patient history. The patient history includes the medications they're on, the over-the-counters they're on, as well as prescription, any medication changes that have happened, any new procedures or pertinent medical information that may affect their outcomes if not told to the hospital for a pharmacologic therapy. Now, within 45 minutes, we are going to get the results of this CAT scan back and we're gonna evaluate if there was a hemorrhage. If there is a hemorrhage, the hospital will initiate their hemorrhage protocol. However, if there's not a hemorrhage, we can say that this is a possible ischemic stroke and we can consider fibrinolytic therapy also known as clot busting therapy. The patient is a candidate, meaning that they do not have any exclusion criteria. TPA will be mixed and administered to the patient. This could be done at bedside by the pharmacist. However, sometimes in smaller institutional settings, it is mixed in the pharmacy and brought down to the stroke itself. However, either can be done and be successful for the patient. The patient will then receive no anticoagulants for 24 hours. The patient is not a candidate for TPA, then they will be administered aspirin. This is also a crucial part 
of the pharmacist in regards to stroke emergencies as they are in communication with the pharmacy to let them know when exactly TPA needs to be ordered and approved uh, for the patient so that way the patient can have better reversal of their stroke. So now Megan's going to go ahead and talk about the TPA inclusion criteria for patients with their last known normal less than three hours. So the RTPA inclusion criteria include include having a last known normal of less than three hours ago, being older than 18 years of age, and having a diagnosis of an ischemic stroke causing neurological deficits. So now Sarah's gonna go over the exclusion criteria. Perfect. So just a quick fun fact about TPA, it was derived from vampire bat saliva. So there was significant clot busting ability for vampire bat saliva. So I just like to throw that fun fact out there. So to start with the TPA exclusion criteria for patients with their last known normal, less than or equal to three hours, uh, we're going to see if they have a prior stroke or a myocardial infarction within the past three months. Any recent trauma within the last 14 days, as this can increase the patient's risk for bleeding if administered TPA or fibrinolytic therapy. Symptoms suggesting a sub subarachnoid hemorrhage or history of an intracranial hemorrhage, again, this would increase the patient's bleeding risk. If the patient's blood pressure is greater than the threshold of 185 over 110, this is an exclusion criteria. However, it can be lowered in the emergency room setting with blood pressure lowering agents to get below that threshold. And then TPA may be administered if the other patient factors do not involve any other exclusion criteria, if we get that blood pressure below the range. If there's any active internal bleeding, any acute bleeding diathesis, including but not limited to a platelet count less than 100,000, heparin within the last 48 hours resulting in an APTT greater than the upper limit of normal, any current use of anticoagulants with an INR greater than 1.7 or a prothrombin time greater than 15 seconds, any current use of direct thrombin inhibitors or direct factor 10A inhibitors, a blood glucose less than 50 milligrams per deciliter, if the CT demonstrates multilobe infarction, if the patient indicates any risk for pregnancy or they think they might be pregnant or are currently pregnant, seizure symptoms or an actual seizure at symptom onset, major surgery within the last 14 days, again, this involves the bleeding risk, recent GI or urinary track hemorrhage in the past 21 days and another exclusion criteria involving bleeding. Now, if we can consider TPA, even if it's beyond three hours, there is guidelines that show that if it's between, if their last known normal is between three and 4.5 hours, there is additional exclusion criteria that would be added on to the column I just read off. And these include if the patient's greater than 80 years of age, we would not do this if their last known normal is greater than three hours to 4.5 hours. If it's a severe stroke with a stroke scale score of greater than 25, if the patient has a history of diabetes or a prior stroke, or if they're taking any anticoagulant at all, regardless of INR. So as you can see, it's a very time sensitive issue. If it was less than three hours, we would just have to look at the INR and make sure it's, it's above one point, if it's below 1.7. However, now that it's for, between three and 4.5 hours, we can't even consider INR or the use of an anticoagulant. So time is really crucial in evaluating stroke emergencies. And this is why identifying the symptoms of stroke for a family member or a patient is crucial. So now Megan's going to go ahead and talk about TPA administration and mixing. So if a patient qualifies for being administered RTPA, it's dose at 0 0.9 milligrams per kilogram IV, with the first 10% of the total dose given as an IV bolus within the first 60 seconds. And then the remaining, the remaining 90% of the dose is given as an IV infusion over 60 minutes. So to quickly go over the RTPA mixing directions, there's a QR code to the left of the poster, and it just you could scan that if you'd want to have a more in-depth set of directions with some nice pictures. Um, but the quick overview of the mixing directions include that it comes in a box with sterile water for injection and the RTPA powder and a transfer device. So you want to pop the tops off the caps of the sterile water in the RTPA clean it with a alcohol swab and then you want to have the transfer device and you want to stick it into 
both sides of the vial. Um, one side's going into the cereal water, the other side's going into the powder, and you want to invert it so that the water goes into the powder side of the vial. And when the water has completely drained out of the vial and into the powder side of the vial, you can take that empty vial off and the transfer device off and gently swirl it, and, and you can let it settle until it's completely dissolved and reconstituted. So now going over to the right side of our poster, I'm gonna go over the benefits of including a pharmacist in stroke emergencies. So having a pharmacist involved in stroke emergencies is beneficial because it could reduce the amount of time from the patient coming in with a stroke to the time that they're administered RTPA. Having a quick administration of RTPA results in the patient having less neurological damage and less loss of neurons and synapses because every second that they go with a stroke that's not being resolved, they lose neurons and they lose synapses. Having quicker administration of RTPA and a reduction in the amount of neurological deficit that they have, then in fourth causes them to have reduced hospital stays and reduce a rehabilitation time which then causes reduced bills for the patients and it causes a reduction in the costs for the payers, which are insurance companies and reductions in costs for institutions. So all around pharmacists are beneficial to have on the stroke code team because that they lead to a reduction in costs, cost saving that could be for both the institution and the payers and the patients, as well as less neurological damage for patients. Any questions from our presentation can be forwarded to both of our emails at the bottom of the poster, sarah.pacheco at uconn.edu and megan.magnus at uconn.edu. Um, feel free to comment on our poster. We love feedback as well. Um, and thank you very much for listening to our presentation.